Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome for our last day of this great school. Uh, my name is Rafael Abrão, I'll be the chairman of this session. I'm very glad to introduce Professor Ernesto Galvão. So here we are, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody. I know it's the last day, it's Saturday morning. Uh, lots of people did you know, part, some partying last night, so thank you for being here this early. Um, so, well, taking a, I, I, I remember that I forgot to mention something which is important about the measurement based on computation, which was the topic of the last lecture, right? And this, this thing is, um, where does the computational power come from in this model, right? We, we have investigated in the circuit model different ways you can combine ingredients to obtain universal quantum computation or some restricted models, but I haven't said anything about this. And because the way, of the, the way this model works, uh, you have the separation between a simple computer and just correlations that you're observing as you measure the resource state, right? So the quantum substrate, the quantum stuff there, is only giving you outcomes, and the, the computation is done by the correlation that appears between the outcomes that you're observing, right? So clearly, what's giving you computational power are the correlations. So there have been some papers analyzing different models, either for full measurement-based quantum computation or for a simplified version of it, in terms of bare inequality, right? So this is interesting, but there's a limitation to this because, <coughs> sorry, because measurement-based quantum computation, um, bare inequalities, you usually assume that you do measurements uh, in, a in, in a space like separated. You can do all measurements at once, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, clearly, a quantum computation in, in this model doesn't happen like that. A quantum computation in this model doesn't happen like that because you do have, you need adaptivity, right? You need to do some measurements and then depending on the outcomes, adapt and change your measurements. So the, the protocol is not exactly like a bell inequality because you need this temporal order, right? So Rausendorf has analyzed uh, the role of quantum contextuality, which is a different uh, property of quantum mechanics. It's a generalization of non-locality, if you like, uh, in these protocols because uh, contextuality is the, is the property that uh, you can exhibit these non-classical correlations, and these correlations need not be among systems which are separated in space, okay? They can be correlations present in a single quantum system, which is the case here, this big entangled cluster, cluster state. is a big one, one big computer. So he analyzes, uh, he, he, he proves that if you, if you don't violate these non-contextuality inequalities, then uh, you can only do very restricted quantum computation with your resource state. Right? You can't do universal quantum computation or universal classical computation even. Okay? So these are interesting things. I won't go much further into that because I want to move into the next um, topic, which is quantum computation with light. Right? How do you use light to, do, to, to, to try to build a quantum computer? And we've, we've heard a lot about this already in the courses here, especially Philip Walter's course, of course. So many of these things I'll be repeating, changing, presenting it some, somewhat differently, so I hope you bear with me. First, I would like to talk a little bit, very quickly, about what I'm not going to talk about this lecture, okay? So that you know it, it exists and you can go to, to some, re some reviews and read about it, because I'm not going to concentrate on that. And that is, what can you do when you use light, use the continuous variables, variables of, of light? So, for example, you can, use, uh, you can describe light as a harmonic oscillator, and a harmonic oscillator you can describe in terms of quadratures. Well, a harmonic oscillator in terms of position and momentum. And you have the equivalent things in terms of the light, of the light field that you have when you quantize it. It's a harmonic oscillator. You can squeeze, you can have vacuum, you can have squeeze vacuum, you can have some dislocated squeeze vacuum, right? And you can play with the, these quantum states of light described by continuous variables, okay, which are the quadratures of the electric field, the phase, intensity, and so on. So, there are many different ideas for how to do quantum computation with this. I just want to point out some recent work, which is quite interesting, uh, a few recent works which are interesting, and which use this kind of encoding. I won't go into the details of that. So, there have been many papers, um, uh, notably by Furuzawa's group in Japan, which use continuous variables uh, produced by these optical parametric oscillators. And in this paper particularly, it's interesting because they they combine the continuous variables production of states and detection at the end 
with some uh, integrated photonics. Uh, and we've seen examples of that in Philip Walter's talk, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. So you discretize the modes here, but you're producing it in a continuous way. So it's a kind of a hybrid approach to doing quantum computation. And actually, the goal of, of this group and many other groups working on this kind of thing is to combine some things which may be easy to do in continuous variables, like producing squeeze states, which are entangled in continuous variables, and transferring them to some discrete system to do quantum computation in a discrete model that we, we know how to work with. So some ideas for, for doing that. Another system which is quite uh, interesting, well, it's, it's used also in that previous uh, implementation, is this optical polymetric oscillator. So we've heard about these nonlinear crystals, which can convert light in a, of high frequency into light with a lower frequency, right? So a parametric down conversion crystal receives one photon, splits it into two photons with less uh, energy, which add up to the original energy, and they are correlated. And this is an entangled pair that you can use for lots of things in quantum information. So this parametric oscillator uh, is, a, is such a crystal inside a cavity. So you can have a very intense field because of this cavity that's trapping the, the light in there. And you can have uh, uh, strong fields which are entangled, which leave the cavity because the, one of the mirrors is, uh, lets a little bit of the light through. So this produces a continuous light which is entangled, right, in frequency. Uh, and this frequency comes. The comb is because of this, well, this thing that looks a little bit like a comb, right? Uh, produces, you can produce light which is entangled, uh, uh, entangled in the frequency degree of freedom. So you have modes of this frequency and this other frequency, around half of the bump frequency actually, which are entangled among themselves. And, this, uh, and because of the many interactions that the light goes through in the middle here, uh, you can have entangled between many different modes here, well, because of the dynamics of this thing. This is an illustration of some kind of cluster state. The square cluster state is not exactly a cluster state. It's a continuous variable cluster state, and the strengths of the interactions are not the same, so it's not exactly CZ that you do, right? But a weaker version of it, say. But it's still entangled. And uh, experiments have used this kind of system to show entanglement in Olivier Fister's group, to show entanglement between 60 modes, okay? So, which is quite impressive. That's quite a recent result. You can also use OPOs to produce light which is entangled in a different way. So you can have two different OPOs, and if you, they produce these pulses of light, and if you make them interact in a beam splitter, you produce these entangled pairs. So what they did in the experiment, they delayed one of the pairs, one member of each pair, this lower one. So they are kind of twisted in time. You see, this guy is ahead of time of this one. But actually, it's overlapping in time with the previous one, right? So if you pass it through a beam splitter again, you create entanglement between this guy and this guy, but this was already entangled with this, and this is already entangled with that. So you're creating large-scale entanglement doing the experiment like this. So it's kind of a, a rail, like a long train of entangled states that you produce and which are flying through, right? You produce, 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 and the thing is flying, entangled. Uh, and the, the, this entanglement has been characterized for 10,000 modes, okay? So 10,000 of these little guys entangled with each other. So the squeezing, the entanglement that they have is not strong enough to do high quality uh, cluster state quantum computation. And the structure is not a cluster state because it's very long and very narrow, right? So you, you might be able to do, for example, single qubit gates, as many as you like, right? 5,000, say. But uh, in, if you can get better quality for the entanglement, but you wouldn't be able to do a large, large scale quantum computation. But of course, they do have theoretical proposals for creating entanglement along this direction in the graph there, so that you can have a more uh, interesting resource, maybe some universal resource for quantum computation. But there lo there's lots to, to do still, but it's quite impressive that they, they were able to see entanglement between, between 10,000 modes in such a system. Right? So it's kind of a machine gun of entangled states of light. Now, moving closer to what I want to talk about here, we, we can encode quantum information in discrete variables of light, okay? One discrete variable you can do is time bin encoding. What's time bin? Time is basically time of arrival. You can, you can encode information in different pulses of light that you're going to send sequentially through some sort, some uh, linear optical interferometer. So you can have, for example, these different pulses of light and you can encode information 
in being in this pose, a photon in this pose, a photon in this pose, or some superposition of it being the two poses, say. Okay? So it's a time domain uh, 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 encoding, right? And this is convenient for fiber optics because you might, you might need to, to get these poses to loop in fiber optics to wait for the other pose to come so that you can superpose the two in some optical element and make them interact. So you, you, and you, can, use, can, you can do that in fiber optics, right? Introduce some delays. It would be best, of course, if you can just hold them there for as long as you want. But you can introduce delays. It's feasible in, in, in fiber optics. You can use other, other, other degrees of freedom, like the orbital angular moment of light. And uh, the quantum optics laboratory at uh, my university, at UF, with uh, Antonio Zalakech, one of the organizers, uh, works a lot in this direction. And you can use photon polarization, which is great. It's very, you can do transformations very, very precisely in photon polarization. We've seen this already. Um, but it's hard to get the two, two, two different polarizations in two photons to talk to each other. Right? This is the main difficulty you have, making photons interact. The, the, the encoding that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss more here is the encoding in path, or in which way the photon is going. Okay? Uh, and there, there's more than one way of doing this encoding. For example, you can do the single rail encoding, which is you have one path that you can send a photon through, and you encode information and being there, there being a photon there or not. Okay? So that's a zero and one. So that seems good, right? Uh, as long as you don't want to do any single qubit gate, because doing a single qubit gate is doing something that will, will say, start with vacuum and produce a superposition of vacuum and one photon. So this doesn't preserve photon number. It's a nonlinear transformation. This is hard to do, right? So single ray encoding is, is bad because of that, because the kind of transformation you need, you need to change photon numbers, and this is hard in quantum optics. There's dual rail encoding, which we will be working with today, which you've seen already. You have two paths, and then you can encode a qubit using just two paths by having one qubit, exactly one photon, in this two-path two system. So this photon can be here, encoding zero, here, encoding one, or in any superposition of zero and one, provided you can prepare these superpositions, right? You can do these dynamics. And you can do these dynamics a single qubit dynamics in the dual rail encoding would involve getting any state of, uh, which is encoded like this, a superposition of the two paths, and changing it into any other state which is a superposition of the two paths. Okay? So how can you do that? You can do this phase gate, right? This phase gate. We, you can choose phi and then re reach some of the gates we, we discussed, which are diagonal and the, and the Z bases. You can do it easily by just adding a phase gate, a, a, a little element which delays the photon, say a, p a little piece of glass, right? Here. So this photon acquires a phase which is different from the photon going up there. So this is a phase gate exactly. And you can put the phase in the zero or in the one. It's very easy. It's just put, putting a little bit of glass in one path or the other. So you can, you can tune it very precisely too. And you can do a two-bit, uh, a two-mode uh, transformation, which will be a single qubit in this encoding, unitary, by using a beam splitter. And if you change this theta parameter, which is uh, related with the transmissivity of the beam splitter, then you, you have all the freedom that you need in order to do any single qubit gate, because you do have this kind of uh, mixing, uh, not, what, this kind of unitary, the beam splitter unitary, and the phase unitary, and the two of them together can, can create any single qubit gate. Okay, so dual rail encoding is good. You can do any single qubit gate in an easy way. Sorry. Of course, the difficulty is doing two qubit gates. Um, so how do you make these photons interact? So what you need to do is to make one of, one of these qubits, which is encoded in two paths, interact with two others, which are encoded a different qubit. Okay? And um, you might do it, uh, this has been mentioned by Philip before, using some medium which have this so-called cross-kernel cross linearity, which is more or less like, if one photon goes through this medium, it changes the property of the medium in such a way that if the other photon goes through, it, it, it will behave differently. So using the medium as a bus to take information from the photon and send to the other. 
Okay, this can be done, but uh, this these gates like that work one time out of ten thousand or say something like that. You know, with very little probability. So that's bad. But uh, the idea of the Neil Laflamme Milburn KLM proposal was to introduce uh, nonlinearities via the measurement process. Okay, we've heard about this already, and uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about how this works. So there are two, two steps okay, to building a quantum linear optical computer using this scheme. Okay? The first step is to do a probabilistic two-qubit gate. And it has to be a gate which creates some entanglement. It has to be a gate which is universal for quantum computation or help single qubit gates become universal. So CZ will do. Okay? We've always been talking about CZ, CNAT will do. Actually, you have other gates which entangle less than those gates, and they will be helpful as well, together with single qubit gates. And uh, the first step is finding one of these, which even if it doesn't work uh, with high probability, provided uh, it tells you if it worked. Okay? So it's heralded. You want a heralded CZ gate, even if the probability is low. And the second thing uh, involves a few tricks so that you can, uh, you can effectively increase the probability of these gates working, okay, in a sense. So um, I will have to go through that. So the first step, finding a, a two-qubit gate that works with some probability is, well, after you found it, it's relatively straightforward. There are a few options, okay? So this is a CZ gate, which is done like this. You start, you, you need these this ancillary modes. So you need, two fold, you, ha, you need to have a single photon gun, okay? A little source that produces single photons. So you put one here and one here. Then you use these beam splitters with some reflectivity given by this angle here, and this other beam splitter with a different reflectivity and this other with a different one, okay? And if you go through, you encode one qubit here and you encode one qubit here. If you go through the circuit, you just have to apply these unitaries corresponding to these elements and then do post selection on finding one, one photon here, one photon here, only when this happens, okay? Only when those two detectors click, then you can see what happened with this qubit and this qubit. And if you work it out, you find that what happens is a CZ gate. Okay, so it is a post-selected CZ gate, and if you find what's the well, you can tune these reflectivities to increase the probability of success, you find the probability of success of this scheme is two over twenty-seven, which is not terribly large. Okay, but we just need something to start with. Do you have questions about that? No. Nope. So this is our probabilistic CZ gate that can be done between two two dual ray qubits. Okay, provided you can prepare single photon states and detect them. So when you detect the two, photo two photons there in the middle, here in the middle, then you know this is a gate worked. Okay, it would be bad if you had a probabilistic gate that works sometimes, but uh, you don't know when. Okay, but this one lets you know when it worked. Now, to turn that into a scalable proposal for, for quantum computation, you need to deal with this problem of the, the, the probabilistic gate being very low probability. Because if you have 10,000 gates in your circuit, each one works with 2 to the 27, the probability of everything working would be 2, to 2 over 27 raised to the power of 1,000. So it's not feasible. It decreases exponentially with the number of gates, right? So you need to do something about it. So the idea that they use, they use two ideas, OK, to sort it out. The first idea had been proposed a couple of years before. It's the gate teleportation idea that I talked to you in the last class, okay? So here I'm showing you what, what you need to do if you want to do CZ gate on entangled states. You want to do, you would like to, well, this is a circuit for qubits again, okay? We would have to transform this into dual rail qubits, uh, optical qubits, okay? But it's just for you to visualize what happens with qubits. So, this is one teleportation step that you have this original state and this original state. You would like to do a CZ gate between them. So you can either get them together and apply the CZ, but we know it works with very little probability if you do that in linear optics. So instead of doing that, you bring the CZ that would be here in the future, okay, of these two guys, and you commute them via these teleportation steps. So you can teleport this guy here, teleport this guy here, and do the CZ. And then you, you do the tricks that I did in the last class, of getting the CZ, which is Clifford, commuting, com commuting with the corrections from the, the teleportation protocol and changing the corrections in, in this process. 
But this is E is intact, and it only changes into Pauli's because it's Clifford, this is a gate. So you can bring them, bring the CZ from here to, to the beginning uh, just by adding different corrections. Okay? That's the property of the Clifford group. And uh, so that you can bring the CZ to the beginning of the computation here. And this means that if you have these two qubits and you don't want to spoil them, you can do the CZ here and try it and try it and try it and try it until it works. Okay? And you have to try a finite number of times because your probability success is finite too. So it's okay, okay to do that. And when it works, then you teleport the other guys and they'll, they'll come out here with the CZ applied to them. So this is called offline uh, preparing of the CZ gates. Okay? And doing things offline is good because it doesn't spoil your computation. You can repeat as many times as you like. It's not an exponential blow up, it's a constant. And you can do that in this way. Okay? But there's a problem, another problem that they had to solve, which is if you, if, you, if you change the circuit into the linear optical circuit to see exactly what you have to do, you find out that here you have to do a bell measurement. That's how teleportation works. You have to do a bell measurement and do the corrections. But uh, a bell measurement is very hard to do in linear optics, and there are proofs that you can't do exa exactly. Okay? There are proofs that you can't do a complete bell measurement with complete success, deterministic, using linear optics. So they had to go around that. So what did they do? They invented a way of doing this belt test with larger and larger entangled states. So instead of having one qubit entangled with the other, they have like a phi plus state. They have large entangled states of many photon states. You have to produce these large entangled states of many photons and do the proper belt test, which involves a quantum Fourier transform over many modes. And and you can show that this bell test will work, okay? These two will work, and this thing will work overall, with a probability of success that you can increase by increasing the number of, of auxiliary photons that you needed in order to produce these entangled states to do this bell test thing, okay? I won't go through the details of that, but you can see that this, go, this probability goes up to one, and actually doesn't need to be perfect. The theorem says it's impossible to do a perfect bell measurement. But you don't need to have a perfect bell measurement. You just need to have a large enough state so that this probability of success of the CZ gate will be above the a threshold. And there's a theorem, fault tolerant theorem, saying that if you do all gates above a certain threshold, then you can do uh, uh, quantum computation, which is indefinitely long using error correction and fault tolerant techniques. So you don't have to have perfect gates. You just have to have per gates with, say, 99 or 98, depends on the proof you have a success probability. So you can get that in this scheme. Okay? So the steps to do the CZ gate. Realize you have to do it, you can do it before on auxiliary qubits instead of, of on the hot qubits that carry the quantum information. So you can do it as many times until you get it right. And realize that this belt test measurement can be done if you have auxiliary states of many photons here with high probability. Okay? But if you work it out, all of it, the, the complexity of preparing these entangled states here and of doing this belt test and so on, you can prove that this thing is scalable, the resources scale linearly with the, the size of the computation you want to do, but it's not practical, okay? So somebody estimated that in order to do one CZ gate with high probability, we would need something like 10,000 optical elements. So we have integrated circuits, but not to that extent yet, right? So, so that's bad. So it's good from a theoretical point of view. In principle, it's possible, but it's not very practical, okay? The KLM scheme. But of course, what I want you to notice here is that this KLM scheme is actually measurement-based quantum computation, okay? It is measurement-based quantum computation with light because you're using the gate teleportation to prepare entangled states, which will be helpful in the, helpful in the future, okay? Uh, you need to do adaptativity uh, you need, to do, you need to use adaptivity depending on the measurements that you do. The adaptivity comes from the corrections you have to do for these bell measurements. Okay? And by doing that with these dual rail encoding qubits, you are able to do any computation you like. Okay? So in a sense, the way I view it, KLM was working with their mind in the circuit model. So they were trying to do gates, right? Entangling gates, they knew. Entangling gates are important. Right? That's what we need to do. But uh, uh, their ideas uh, actually resulted in a scheme, which is a measurement-based scheme, okay? 
but measurement-based computation was invented the same year, you know. So it was with the one-way model. So it was kind of concurrent. It was happening at the same time. So these days, uh, most, I mean, many of the efforts that you see more recent research on these things, they bypass completely the circuit model, and they go straight to the cluster state model, okay? They know that if you can entangle, entangle create big entangled states, you can do quantum computation the measurement-based way. So they go straight for that instead of emulating a CZ gate like that, you see? So the, there are many ideas for jo how to join, how to start with EPR pairs. You can do measurements here. And with some probability, the EPR pair grows. And uh, if you do enough of them, you can grow them like this and like this, and you, you end up with a cluster state. And if things fail, it's fine. Your computation is not being done yet. You cannot try again. So sometimes the cluster grows, sometimes it decreases in size. Once you have the right size, enough for you, then uh, you do the computation by doing single qubit measurements. And you can do that exactly that in linear optics, you see? So instead of trying to emulate these gates, you can go straight to the measurement based on computation model and take it from there. So now, uh, now I'd like to talk. Well, do you want to ask something about that, about that model? OK, so this is my little uh, description of the KLM, how the KLM scheme works. Now, in the, in the spirit of what we've been doing so far, I want to take the KLM scheme, or linear optics, linear optics, which is universal for quantum computation, including adaptive measurements, and take out what made it universal for quantum computation, which is adaptivity. Now I want to ask, what if you have this big interferometer, you can put single photon states in the interferometer, like those in the dual ray preparation. Uh, you can do, use interferometer, but you're forbidden from measuring and adapting the circuit accordingly. You just use the interferometer, okay? What can you do with an interferometer and single photon states, okay? So this is linear optics without adaptivity. So there, 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 have been, there has been this proposal by Scott Aronson. Of course, interferometers have been used for a long time, right? What they did was to analyze very carefully uh, what computation an interferometer like that can do, okay? And to come up with a problem which they can show is hard to classical, for a classical computer to do, modulus some assumptions which are quite reasonable from computation complexity. So what they did was to kind of vindicate uh, the interferometers as something that can do a very hard computation, okay? And to analyze this very carefully so that they can uh, account for uh, errors as well, so that you can actually compare what the interferometer is doing in a noisy laboratory with what a classical computer would have to do in order to do the equivalent thing. So that's the idea of the model. And that's called boson sampling, because it works for any bosons. It doesn't need to be photons, but of course photons are the natural bosons that everybody likes and works with. So we ha let's just have a look again at how linear optics works. So a linear optical circuit, we've seen, can't change the number of photons, okay? So it, what it can do is to take a photon that goes through one path and distribute it among many paths without changing the photon number, right? And you can show that the most general way to do this is to, to make a, uh, create a system which implements a mapping, a map which, can, which is a unitary map between uh, creation operators when creation operators input in creation operators and output creation operators. So that's the most linear, the most general linear transformation you can do is described by this unitary. And the unitarity guarantees that the photons are not being created or destroyed in the process, okay? So that's mathematics, unitary. Physically, uh, a linear interferometer is one uh, which it looks a, a little bit like this. This is a linear interferometer for five modes. And it can be built out of little systems, which is beam, beam splitters and phase shifts, as I told you about. Okay, and any interferometer, any unitary can be decomposed in terms of these elementary blocks. Um, so that's convenient, of course, because it, it tells you doing an arbitrary interferometer of a certain size is feasible. Okay, if it's m by m, it takes order of m squared elements because you have this triangle full of them, right? Um, and then what happens when you look at, uh, at the dynamics of single photons going through this interferometer? Uh, you find out that the probability of outputs, for example, the probability of entering one, one photon here, one here, and one here, and leaving one here, one here, and one there, say, 
any probability of any event this way is given by the permanent of a matrix. And this matrix, UST, I should have put it there. No, not, I shouldn't have, actually. This matrix is associated with you. It's a sub-matrix of you, okay? Or a composition of columns and, 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 and lines of this you, depending on the, on the measurement you're talking about, okay? So this was known for a long time, maybe 20 years or 30 years, maybe even. Uh, but this is key for all the results that we found more recently about the complexity of these systems. Okay? So, for example, the probability that you have, imagine an experiment in this interferometer, you have one, one photon in each mode, five photons. And you want to ask, what's the probability that at the output you get exactly one photon per mode again? Of course, they could have bunched. There could be two photons in one, three. There are many different possibilities. But what's the probability of this event that they come out one in each mode? It's exactly modulus squared of the permanent of the unitary that describes this interferometer that you can find if you know very easily, if you, find, if you know all the transmissivities and, and phase, phase gates that you put here. You can work out what U is. It's a M by M, in this case, 5 by 5 unitary. And the permanent of that unitary squared gives you this probability. Okay? You can calculate it. If you know linear optics, you can calculate it without realizing it's a permanent. Okay? But it's a permanent. And a permanent is exactly like the determinant, but it doesn't have negative signs. And this completely changes the complexity of calculating it. Uh, actually, I need to talk a little bit more about permanents. But before, I'll give you just a simple example. You've seen it before. But I'll explain it in terms of permanents. If you have a beam splitter with one photon here and one photon here, it's the simplest uh, example of a, a linear interferometer that I had before. This is a two-mode interferometer. And you can tune the, the beam splitter by changing transmissivity and reflectivity. But in general, you have this unitary. The probability that your two photons will come out here and here, exactly one here, one here, is the permanent of u modulus squared. Okay? How do you calculate the permanent? This times this plus this, this times this. But because of the i's there, this gives you t squared minus r squared. Okay? So that's the probability that your photons will come out uh, in separate modes. Okay? And you've, if you worked with linear optics, you, you've done this calculation many times. But this is known as the hongo mandel effect. Because if you have a balanced beam splitter, T equals R, and the probability that the two of them will come separately here is zero. Okay? So basically you're saying the permanent is zero in this case when T equals R. You can see it here. Right? The probability of them coming out separately is zero. So this is the famous hongo mandel effect. If not coming out separately, they have to come out together. That's the hongo mandel effect. So I told you that the probability of this particular event, all photons coming in, one in each mode, and then one fo all photons coming out one in each mode is the permanent square. Right? What if I have different input states and different output states? I want to know what's the probability of these photons coming out in separate modes, coming in in separate modes, and coming out all in the same mode, for example. That's a different event. Right? How do you calculate it? So I'll just show you with an example how do you do. You start with the unitary that describes the three mode interferometers in, in this example. Okay? So it's a unitary matrix. You can find these coefficients from the reflectivities of the three beam splitters that comprise a three mode interferometer, a general three mode interferometer, and the phase shift. Now, you start with the initial state, let's say one photon in the first mode, one in the second, and no photon in the third. And you want to know what's the probability of they, they coming out in this configuration. Okay, photons in the first and third modes only. Okay, so how do you do the calculation? You get the unitary from the interferometer that you can find from the decomposition. You pick the columns indicated by these input states. So you pick the first two columns because there's a one here and one here. Right, one here, one here means pick the first two columns. And now from this matrix here, you pick the first and the third lines because that's the output that you want to, to calculate the probability. So from this one, you pick this line and this line. This gives you a two by two matrix. Okay? And uh, the permanent of this matrix squared is the probability that you're looking for. So the probability that the photons will come out in this configuration and leave in this configuration in an in a interferometer described by this unitary is given by this number. Okay? This times this plus this times this, modulus squared of this, because this will typically be uh, complex. 
Do you have a question about this? I didn't prove it, okay? I'm telling you what the rule is. You can go in Scott Saronson's papers or many other papers, even previous, or a long time before, actually, and find that this is true, okay? So this is a very compact way of, uh, of expressing outcomes, probabilities of outcomes of linear optical experiments. Okay? Now, back to the permanent, right? I told you the permanent is, li is like the determinant, but it doesn't have minus signs. So if you, if you remember the definition of the, permanent, the determinant, you, can have, you have all products of these uh, 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 matrix elements, but you have to permute them. And depending on the, on the parity of the permutation, you have to add the minus sign or not. Okay? The permanent doesn't have that. It's all plus. So this means the permanent of this matrix is just the usual rule you're using with determinants, but when you, when you do like this and then come back, you don't come back with a minus sign. You come back with a plus sign. So this is the formula for the permanent of a three matrix. But if you had a, a 100 by 100 matrix, that would involve the number of permutations of these 100 elements. And that's exponential in, in the number of elements. Okay? So the number of terms you have here is huge. And the difference between the determinant and the permanent is that the minus signs that you get enable you to do the calculation without following this definition here. So in order to compute the determinant, you don't actually find out what all the exponentially many terms are and add and subtract them. You do other tricks, okay, which make this calculation uh, feasible, tractable. The permanent doesn't allow for these shortcuts. Okay? The permanent is hard to compute. Uh, it's exponentially sized. Okay? So, it has been proven that uh, approximating the permanent of arbitrary real valid matrices or complex matrices too is sharp P complete, which means it solves any problem that's sharp P. And sharp P, as Richard uh, Joseph mentioned yesterday, is the class of problems associated with counting the number of solutions to NP problems. Okay? So, if you can approximate the permanent of a large matrix, you can actually count how many uh, paths there are between cities above us, uh, below a certain size, which is solving the traveling, tra traveling salesman problem. Not just find one or find whether there is a path which is smaller than uh, a certain length, but actually counting how many you have. So this is believed to be strictly harder to do than actually just solving an NP-complete problem, which is everybody thinks is very hard too, right? That you shouldn't be able to. Okay? But if the matrix it has only no negative elements, they're all, for example, positive, real, positive, then there's an efficient algorithm to approximate the permanent with additive error that was found in 2004. Okay? So, <coughs> overall, the permanent is hard to calculate, okay? And if you put the best algorithm that's known on Mathematica on a laptop, this is the kind of time that you find, and I did that with, with Daniel. Um, if you want to compute the permanent of a 15 by 15 matrix, random matrix, unitary, it takes 20 milliseconds, fine. If you want a 25 by 25, that's 10 seconds, that's like 1,000 times more. And if you go for 35 to 35, it's like 1,000 times longer too, okay? So, of course, if you extrapolate this curve, and we can know, then uh, if you want a 45 by 45, it will take a year, okay, uh, on a single computer. So. It's an exponential scaling. Everybody has seen this before. Okay? So this means in the boson sampling problem, if you have an interferometer with 50 photons and you want to compute the probability associated with a particular outcome, this will take you forever, <laughs> basically, right? Because it will involve finding, calculating the probability uh, associated with the permanent, which is 50 by 50, of a 50 by 50 matrix. But of course, you don't need to do that. That would be strong simulation. So you have to ask the question, how hard it is to do weak simulation of this process? And that's the, uh, the, the question that uh, Scott Aronson and Arkhipov answered. So what they proposed was, do this, do this experiment, okay? They proposed a, a problem which is, simulate weakly what the experimenter does naturally, which is input n indistinguishable photons in an m, m, m by m interferometer. So it's described by unitary, which is m by m. m is, a, is usually larger than n, okay? Then let the interference happen, <coughs> and your task is to sample from the same distribution that the experiment gives you. So 
you have to say, okay, first event is going to be photons coming out here, there, and there. Second event is going to be photons coming out this, here, and here. But you need to do it the same way that the quantum computer will do, the interferometer will do. You need to output these numbers with the same distribution that's calculated using the permanence. Okay? So that's the problem. So the problem is actually simulating this, this quantum interferometer outcomes okay? in the weak way, in the weak sense, just sampling from that distribution. And it's, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to show that exact weak simulation of this is hard using the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy argument that I showed you before. Remember, I showed you, take the restricted model, add post-selection, and if you get everything that quantum mechanics can do with post-selection, this means the original model is hard to, to, to simulate weakly. Okay? So taking a linear interferometer like this, <coughs> we know that if we are able to do adaptive measurements, you get KLM, which is BQP. You can do a quantum computer. I just explained to you the KLM model. That's linear optics with adaptativity. Okay? But of course, instead of that adaptativity, you can just post-select on all those ones in the CZ gates to work. Okay? And if you do this post-selection with post-selection, you get BQP again. Okay? If you're very lucky and all the CZs work without need or anything, right? This gives you BQP. This computes everything. It's exponentially low probability of that happening, but that would happen with post-selection. Okay? And if you get BQP, you can always post-select a few more modes, and you can get post-BQP too. Because you're already post-selecting. Post-selecting more is easy, physically, in the same model. So this means if you get such an interferometer and you post-select on some modes, you could do, in principle, everything that quantum mechanics can do with post-selection too. This means the original model, which doesn't have adaptivity or post-selection, must be hard to simulate okay? by this complexity argument that I didn't actually explain to you but uh, which goes through. It's a mathematical statement. Uh, it's a mathematical statement relying on a hypothesis, which is a non-collapse of this polynomial hierarchy. Okay? Of course, uh, all these complex results always rely on some hypothesis. Do you have questions about that? So this means this experiment is hard to simulate weakly exactly. But this is unfair to ask, because if an experimentalist does this, it's not going to work perfectly. It's going to be some mistake. So the question I have to ask is, how hard it is to simulate this thing approximately? Okay? Because the experiment itself will have errors, so you have to allow the classical simulation to, be, to have a little bit of error, too. Okay? Does this change things or not? And actually, uh, the main contribution of Aronson and Arkhipov is to show that even approximate weak simulation is hard in this model, provided you, you, you accept some hypothesis, okay? Which is that uh, permanence of these sub-matrices of U, which give you the probabilities, they must be hard to approximate. Basically saying these matrices are like the general case and not like positive matrices, which, for example, we have this, this algorithm, okay? Uh, so there's evidence for this hypothesis. It's believed to be true. And there's another, another hypothesis which is too technical for me to mention, okay? Or even to understand, maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, um, so if you go through the proof, you, you find that the technical requirements for it to work demand that the number of modes is much larger than the number of photons you use, okay? Uh, actually, of the order of n to the 5, and with some other conjecture, order of n to the 2, but it may be even linear. Okay, for this argument, approximate simulation argument to go through. So this means that uh, the, in the experiment, ideally, you would have to have a few photons and many modes. Okay, and this is convenient for experimentalists because this guarantees that the outputs will very, very rarely have photons coming out together in the same mode. So if you just have single photon detectors that click, if there's one, two, three, or fo four mo more photons, and you put them there, it's fine because Almost always, there will only be one photon in each mode, okay? Because you have more, many more modes than photons. Notice, however, that what the experiment is doing is not calculating a permanent for you. It would be nice if you if you just decide I want to calculate this permanent, which is a sharply hard problem. So you you wire a unitary, okay? 
uh, which is exactly the unitary, the, the matrix you would like to calculate the payments, okay? And then run the process. What's the problem with doing that? Some people know, well, you know. Do you have some idea? Why doesn't that calculate permanent to you? Because the probability that all photons come out one per mode is the permanent squared. Okay? It is. The problem is this permanent is so small, it's exponentially small typically for a random unitary, that this event will hardly ever happen. So in order to estimate it, it would need to wait an exponential time. Okay? Because it's exponentially mo small. You know, we know already uh, but from Richard Joseph's talk that you can't estimate well an exponentially small probability because this demands an exponential cost in terms of sample complexity, which is time in the laboratory. Okay? So there's no time to wait. You can't wait the, the, the age of the universe for you to estimate that probability okay? because it's so small. So it's actually the, the interferometer is sampling from this distribution of exponentially many outcomes, each of which has an exponentially small probability of happening, which is given by a permanent. You see? So this is what the experiment does. Somehow, it seems, in its head, right? The experiment knows the permanence because it has to do this, right? If quantum mechanics is right. But it, do, it, it doesn't allow you to explore this to calculate the permanence that you want, okay? Unless the permanence is very high, then uh, with high probability this will happen, but this is a very rare and uh, atypical situation, okay? Hint, you will need that if you want to, to, answer, to answer the question for this talk. Well, I gave the hint too late, right? <laughs> okay, so this is another proposal. Uh, this is just a little change in the uh, boson sampling problem to make it easier for experimentalists, okay? Uh, it's called uh, scattershot boson sampling or boson sampling with Gaussian states. It's, it was proposed here in this paper by Lund et al. I forgot the, 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 the put the reference. And the idea is this, experimentally, the way you, you put the single photons in an interferometer today, all the experiments that have been done were doing with parametric down conversion sources. So you get a laser, it produces two photons, one of them goes into the interferometer, and the other one you detect to know that that one went into the interferometer. It's a heralding photon, okay? So you can put many of these PDC sources to feed the interferometer with single photons, okay? And you know when they, they went in, Ideally, because you, you, you register the heralding photon. Now, the idea of this, uh, of this setup is instead of, if you want to put three photons in a very large interferometer, okay, instead of just using three sources in the first three modes, you can have sources in all modes, okay, as many as you can, experimentally, with your, with your budget. Okay? And then in each laser pulse, you see some of these firing at random. So sometimes the photon will go one, two, and seven, sometimes seven, eight, and three. And you can't control this because it's a probabilistic process, okay? So the idea of the boson, scattershot boson sampling is it's fine if you can't control the input, okay? Because simulating this process with a random input is as hard as simulating the process with a fixed input because it will all come down to calculating or approximating permanence, okay? That's the intuitive sense. So by redefining the task this way, you are able to use many sources instead of just the fixed ones that the original proposal had. And the advantage of doing that is that if, you want, if, you, if each source works with probability epsilon and you want n of them to work, this is the probability that all of them will work in the same pulse, okay? Epsilon to the n. But if you have uh, k sources, okay, then uh, instead of just n, uh, the n sources, then you have this uh, binomial, binomial uh, distribution uh, coefficient, binomial coefficient enhancement in the probability, which is very high. I mean, if m is much larger than n, as usually assumed this, this is exponentially high, in, higher in, in terms of n. So it's very good, you see? So this was a, was a proposal that was done later and actually makes the lives of the experimentalists uh, easier because you can in enhance the rate of single photon of, of, of events that you observe in this kind of uh, experiment. Okay? So I'm done with the general description of boson sampling. I want to just review a few of the things that we've seen. 
by going back to the crazy slide that I presented at the beginning. And then I'll talk a little bit later after this about experiments, actual experiments, because I've been collaborating with some groups and we've been doing experiments, boson sampling experiments. So before we move there, um, here's a picture of some intermediate models of quantum computation, maybe some simulable. Let's see what happens. First thing we did was to look at quantum circuits and to show what were the requirements for them to do universal quantum computation. What kind of gates you need, uh, Clifford are enough or not, uh, what, what, um, how to decompose, uh, what, what sorts of universal sets of gates you have, and so on. Then we defined, we defined another class of circuits in which the gates all commute. So that's a restriction. Actually, we didn't come from here to that, right, like I show. We came from here, and insisting that the gates have to commute, we went to there. So we defined a model which is less powerful, but it's still uh, hard to simulate exactly weakly using this polynomial hierarchy uh, argument, the IQP. Okay? Then I mentioned this DQC1 model, which is also restricted, doesn't seem to be able to do everything a quantum computer can do, but with advantage of, of being useful. So that's a new category, right? You, you, you need restricted models which are useful. So that's nice. Okay? Then I mentioned, okay, if you restrict this quantum circuits to Clifford group, uh, and the usual computational basis input, computational basis output, then this is sim simulable in a classical computer. And of course, Richard Jose in the last course, in his last talk, gave a wonderful characterization of all the ways you can, you can change this thing and bring it here or here maybe uh, with a finer, gra finer uh, grained description, including the importance of adaptivity, of simulation of one wire or more wires, and so on. Okay? But I only, the only thing I showed here was that with, with uh, magic states, you can go from here to there. Then I talked to you about measurement-based quantum computation, which is universal, so it's equivalent to quantum circuits. Everything here has to be equivalent. And it's restriction if you don't allow for adaptivity. Okay? So what if you produce a highly entangled state, you measure them, but you don't wait for anything. You just measure. You don't adapt. Right? And if you do that, the me by definition, okay, you get non-adaptive measurement-based quantum computation. But what can you do with non-adaptive measure measurement-based quantum computation? You can do IQP circuits. You can solve the problems in IQP using non-adaptivity in measurement-based quantum computation. Right? So there's a connection between these two models here. They're restricted. They seem to be hard to simulate too weakly. Then today, I told you how you can do a universal quantum computation using linear optics. And we needed adaptivity right, for that to work. But if you lost adaptivity, then you went back to boson sampling. Okay? Boson sampling is exactly what can you do with linear interferometers with no adaptivity. Right? So boson sampling is here, and you have this hardness proof too. And there's a connection with non-adaptive measurement-based computation because you can always do a mapping between this is a particular type of non-adaptive measurement-based computation uh, with a different type of, uh, uh, or actually this. Well, you can do this in optics. Well, you have to go around here, okay? But they're, they're related too. Then I'm mentioning something just to help Richard's next talk. Uh, if instead of bosons you have fermions, we'll see that fermions that don't interact are easy to simulate. And there are gates that you can define based on them by doing a jordan wigner transformation. So you map this fermionic system into qubits, and the gates which correspond to these dynamics of free fermions are called match gates, and they are simulable. There are many ways of bringing them from here to here too, but you hear about this from Richard. And if you take non-adaptive measurement-based quantum computation, but you only measure along Pauli bases, then you can do a simulation of that. So that would be something like Clifford measurement-based quantum computation. Yes, question. Yes. Yes, it works in 1D, or it works also in the circle, 1D, but with a, a different boundary condition. Yes, if you have a 2D free fermionic model that corresponds to interacting to other, other gates, and actually this is universal for quantum computation. So you can, you can look at different transitions you get, either in the, in the qubit view, 
of the chain. For example, if you have the chain and one add the added edge, you just have one qubit which is connected to the chain. This is already universal. The kind of the, the dynamics corresponding to that is already universal. Uh, and uh, we've done some papers about that, about con uh, how connectivity affects universality. I did that with Daniel Broad, who is here. Um, yeah. So. Yes. True. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, so he's asking how exactly does the this equivalence between boson sampling and echo peak work? It's just that with boson sampling, if you use KLM encoding, you you can do measurement based on computation, but boson sampling doesn't allow for adaptivity. So it's measurement based without adaptivity, and we know that that can do IQP. Okay, but uh, I don't know exactly how the the hardness uh, the hardness proofs. Because maybe you can use a hardness proof for one model to imply something for the other, you see? Uh, but this one also col col collapses the polynomial hierarchy, like this one does. But maybe the proofs are a bit different. I think there are translations that can be done. And this is, I just put together this slide, and I think there are lots of interesting connections among these classes which have not been properly uh, explored. Okay. Do you have other questions about this big view, other thing? Before I move on, this is of course somebody asked why 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 did boson sampling was was boson sampling in the middle? It's just because um, it's my view. Okay, if you ask other people, they don't even care about restricted models of quantum computation. There wouldn't be even this intermediate thing here. Uh, they wouldn't care about it. Or if they work with topological quantum computation, they would talk about other models like different types of anions, which give you which give you uh, computational power here, here, or here. Okay, if they work with different models. I'm learning a little bit about topological computation because of these connections with these models too. But uh, it's a very particular view, peculiar view, it's mine, okay? Um, but I like it. Any other questions about it? Okay. So now I, I want to talk a little bit about boson sampling experiments. I'm not an experimentalist at all, okay? But uh, I've been helping with the theory side uh, to some experiments. And he, here, are, here are pictures from four different experiments which implemented boson sampling. Okay? These experiments were done by the Wamsley group, the Philip Walter group, Andrew White group, and Fabio Shahino group in Rome. And I participated on this one. Um, and I'll be, I'll be talking more about it. What they all have in common is that they made interference experiments with three photons. Because two photon experiments, I mean, the Hongo Mando effect that was observed in 87 is already uh, a boson sampling experiment, okay, with two photons. So the next non trivial case is three photons. And they used uh, uh, integrated waveguides and sometimes not integrated waveguides, like this one, to, to do interference of three or four photons in chips with five or six modes, okay, a couple years ago. And they found out that the probabilities were given by permanence of three by three submatrices of this 5x5 five five or 6x6 six six matrix, okay? Like quantum mechanics predicts, okay? So they, they verified this works. Um, what I want to talk from here on is all about a collaboration that I, I've been uh, having with uh, the, quantum the, the quantum optics groups of Rome, headed by Fabio Sciarino and Paolo Mataloni, and uh, Milan, headed by Roberto Ocellame. And I've been working on this uh, together with Daniel Broad, who is here, who used to be my PhD student, and now is a, a postdoc at the Perimeter Institute. And these are some publications, publications we've had so far uh, with experiments of this type. So I'll just talk about like three different things in which there is some theoretical aspect which we've been involved with uh, in these experiments. So the first one is, how do you make these interferometers, right? So if you make them like I drew, drew them here, with beam splitters, you never align them. There will be the, the distances and the orientations will fluctuate with temperature. It will be horrible. You won't be able to do that. Nobody did that with more than three modes, I think. Okay? So the, the key is to go to integrated circuits, because then the elements are all made in a single piece of glass, and uh, they are stable. So the way to do this is using, as Philip Walter described, uh, a very powerful laser 
you can move a piece of glass with respect to this laser. It's focused just below the, the surface of the glass, and it creates a waveguide by changing the, the refraction index. So it's a little bit like etching a, a, a fiber optic, optical cable inside the glass with this laser. And that's all fine. Uh, and Roberto Zelemi's group in Milan has t uh, techniques to do that. But the, the challenge for a boson sampling experiment was we wanted the unitary to be random. And I didn't mention that before. But if you, if you, if you, if you say, I'm going to do a boson sampling experiment, and the unitary picked is identity, OK? It's one of those unitaries which you know exactly what's going to happen with probability 1. The, the, the permanent is 1, OK? The photons are going to come in and come out exactly as they, in, they went in. So you can't do that. You need to have an, a, a unitary which has randomness in it, first because the proof was done for hard random, uniformly random unitaries, and second because we know that if you introduce some uh, restrictions on the unitary, maybe you fall in a class which is easy to simulate. So that's why they pick random, right? So we wanted random unitaries. So how, how do they implement a random interferometer? So the design they, they came up with was this. Phase shifters. So uh, you have a drawing like this of waveguides. And phase shifts are acquired by the photon as it travels from this zone of approximation with other waveguide to this other one. You see, all these little red and blue balls are phase shifts. Are the phase shifts acquired by the photon naturally as it travels in the waveguide? And then what you can do is, if you want the photon to acquire a bigger or a smaller phase shift in this region here, then you can just uh, change the form, this S band here, a little bit. And by deforming it a little bit, you can acquire any phase shift you want. So that's all nice, right? But on top of that, you need to be able to change the transmissivity, which is the probability that by evanescent field coupling, this photon will jump from one fiber to the other, from one waveguide to the other. So one way to do this would be to bring them closer together or make them further apart. You have exponential control like that. But if you do that, then you mess up with the phase shifts because you're changing the, the length of the whole thing. So how do you make them jump more or less without messing up with the lengths of all the, all the elements between one and the other coupling regions? You see? That, that was a problem. Because if you fix here and fix here, you can deform this thing. And fine, you can acquire any phase shift you like. But now you can't, ma you can ma you can, you can't move this thing, because otherwise you're, you're, you're changing this to the, the yellow zone. You see what the problem is? So what they came up with was, look, this laser, it can make the waveguides not just in a plane, but the waveguides can go deeper and shallower inside the glass. You have a 3D capability, right? So what they did was to keep the same length of all waveguides, but then they, they etched the waveguides, rotated with respect to the main plane. So by doing this, you can approximate and make them go further apart without changing the lengths of each waveguide. So that's how they, they did it. Later on, we used some other designs because this waveguide design is not symmetric. With, I mean, all, not all photons go through the same number of curves, which means not all photons not all inputs and output combinations have the same losses. So this makes it for a symmetrical design with respect to losses, which is bad, because you have to reconstruct those losses. Right? So instead of that, we, we changed the design to have 50-50 beam splitters and random phases that you can pick. It's not a completely universal design anymore. It doesn't, you can't implement any unitary like that, but with the simulations, and the unitaries are random enough, or seemed random enough for the experiments. And uh, we've actually built uh, large interferometers for other versions of the experiment that we've performed. This is a picture of the scattershot boson sampling that was implemented for the first time by the Rohn group in this paper very recently. So the idea is to have, of course, we wanted them, OK, use scattershot boson sampling to have more photons. You know, instead of three, let's go for five, because then you have many photons, many sources. Maybe you can get more photons. But they said, no, wait, wait. We're always asking experimenters something, and they're saying, no, your, your theory streams are unrealizable. You know, tone it down, please. So what they did was, OK, let's do it with three photons again. But we'll show that the rate that you get is increased if you have more more detect more sources. So that's what they did. So instead of having three sources, they had they had, how many? Six. OK? 
So one source had the two photons going in, and the other five sources were working the scattershot way. You know, some of them would work in each run, and you would have to 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 look at the heralding photon to know which which ones which one worked. You see, so this way instead of having one source and then another one giving you the third photon, you had five possibilities for the third photon. So this, this could increase the rate by five, and actually experimentally they found a 4.5 increase in the rate, in the photon, in the event rate. So that was the main result that they got. And we managed to characterize the interferometer, not characterize the interferometer, but show that it was actually doing boson sampling this different way. So uh, then we come to the data. Like once you get the data, what do you do with the data, okay? And this is going to be uh, the kind of uh, characteristic that simulation experiments and very complex experiments, quantum experiments in the future, we always have, okay? Look at this data. These are all the input states you could have in the scattershot. They can vary because you have this scattershot characteristic. And these are all the output that you can get, okay? If you put together the two, there are almost 2,000 different co uh, combinations, input-output. So there are 2,000 bins, you know, events that could happen, about 2,000. But uh, a run, an experimental run, takes about 6,000 events, okay? So this means for each bin, you have an average of three events. No one is going to reconstruct a probability based on three events, okay? And this is going to be true for any large-scale experiment, which involves sampling. Uh, so you get these events, you get one or none, you know, sometimes some, some bins have no events. So how do you say, how can you certify, or at least have some idea, or convince someone that this thing is doing what it should be doing, doing boson sampling, okay? So that's the problem of certification that uh, Leandro is talking about in his lectures. So I can tell you two different ways we did some partial certification, which Leandro calls benchmarking, okay? There are different ways for this, to, to, to call this for this experiment, okay? The first one was a proposal by Scott Aronson and Arkhipov again, which showed, okay, if we don't want to compute the permanence, the experiment is very complicated. In this case, we could, but imagine in a larger experiment, you can't compute the permanence. You don't have the, 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 the computational power to do that. They proposed a, a, a quantity which can be efficiently calculated, okay, and which is correlated with the permanent. So it plays a role of the permanent. It's correlated with it. But the advantage is it's, it's efficiently calculatable from the unitary matrix that you're given at the beginning, okay? And using this, they can analyze, they can analyze the event, event by event, the data, event by event, and compare. Uh, does, the, does this have a high value for this R thing, which is correlated with the high probability expected from boson sampling or not? And using that, we, we analyze the data and we, we become convinced that boson sampling data looks like boson sampling, more than it looks like a uniform sample of all distributions. And this was done for interferometers of different size, 13, 7, 5, and 9. And you can also simulate events which are output with a uniform distribution and check whether there's no false positives, right? Because they have to be identified by the discriminator as a uniform event, or uniformly sampled event rather than a boson sampling event. And this actually happens. Uh, to within experimental error, of course. So this is one discriminator. The advantage is it's scalable. The disadvantage is it's only capable of saying whether your events look more like boson sampling than or more like a uniform distribution, you see? It's not certifying much. It's just saying, is this random completely, uniformly random? Or it has some structure which is correlated with the structure of the interferometer. That's not much, but it's something, and it's scalable. The second approach, is to use Bayes' rule, okay, to, you, to do a Bayesian certification of the events. And what do we do? For each event that we get, we calculate the boson sampling probability associated with it, and we calculate the probability associated with it by any, any alternative hypothesis you care about. So maybe you, want, you say, oh, these experiments can't build indistinguishable photons, so I'll calculate the probability that this event would happen if the photons were distinguishable. This could be the null hypothesis there, you see? So if you calculate these two, uh, if, if this ratio is larger than one, it means boson sampling is more likely to be the explanation for this event. If this ratio is smaller than one, because this guy is bigger, 
it means the other hypothesis is more likely to be the good explanation. Okay, and this is just probabilistic reasoning. Okay, this, this tells you how you should bet if uh, you had to make a bet about this event coming from these two hypotheses. You see? So what we do here, we plot how many events were identified as boson sampling using this rule. And uh, as the number of, uh, as the run goes, the boson sampling data falls here, which is a positive value of the discriminator, saying there are more events that are identified as boson sampling than as, you know, as, uh, as the alternative distribution. And the alternative distribution here is that the photons are distinguishable. So we're testing for that particular one. But this, this thing can be done for any distribution, any alternative distribution that you can compute the, the, the probabilities. Okay? The disadvantage of this, or the advantage is, you can do it for any distribution for which you can compute the probability. And the disadvantage is that you have to calculate the boson sampling probability. So if you have an experiment for up, with up to 35 photons, you can still do it, as we saw. But if you have an, a, 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 experiment, a boson sampling experiment with 100 photons or 50 photons, then you won't be able to do that. It's not scalable. Okay? I'm coming close to the end. Um, I just wanted to mention a few, a few more recent uh, developments in boson sampling, in theory and experiment. Uh, this, this is a proposal for doing boson sampling using time bin. So you would send photons in different pulses here, and you make them go around these loops so that they overlap at a single beam splitter. If you can change the transmissivities of this beam splitter fast enough, then you can do this scheme in which the photons will all interact at the same beam splitter as if it was this big beam splitter. Because instead of having the modes, you just have the different pulses which are distinguishable by one, by one from the other by the timing. So it's a way of using time multiplexing, okay? Using time as an ally to, to be able to separate the modes. The modes are gonna be time bins. Uh, and there has been very, well, last month, uh, an analysis of the errors of this model, which was missing from the original paper. This has appeared in Philip Walter's uh, talk. It's a very impressive setup from the Bristol group. It's a, a completely universal six-mode uh, interferometer. Because the interferometers I showed you, you made them on glass, and then they're there. They're fixed. You can't change them after you've etched the, the waveguides. But this, this interferometer is actually can be dynamically changed. Okay, so you can change all the phases and transmissivities, the equivalent thing. And, and because of that, they can do boson sampling on thousands of unitaries. They can do uni uh, Fourier transform uh, on six modes. They can, uh, they can characterize indistinguishable states of six photons. They can do lots of stuff, you know, all automatized. So that's quite impressive. This was done in Japan in a collaboration with uh, the Bristol group. Daniel Broad is going to be talking next week about his proposal which is how can you do boson sampling if you have a very short chip? And the problem with having these long glass chips is that all the curves that the photos go through result in losses, right? But you can do, uh, there's a theoretical argument showing that you can do it with just four beam splitter layers. So as you increase the boson sampling uh, interferometers, you would have a, a, an increasing depth of the chip. So you would have a loss that would increase exponentially with the depth. So it's important to keep the depth restricted, and he analyzed how you can do boson sampling. Still hard to simulate exactly in this case, not approximately. We don't have a proof of that. He doesn't have a proof of that on small chips. So that's another theoretical development. And there have been some applications proposed for boson sampling. Not exactly boson sampling, like molecular vibronic spectral calculations by the Asperu Guzik group. He showed that you can do with a linear optical setup do uh, a simulation of the, the spectra of molecules. But this simulation requires to input not single photon states like in boson sampling, but to input continuous variable squeeze states. And the squeezing has to be very well done. I mean, the parameters of the squeezing has to be very crafted for this to work. So it doesn't seem very realistic, but it's interesting because you're using non-adaptive circuitry, but with a different state, a bit like magic state, you see? you might be able to get something extra out of that because you're changing the input. And there's been a proposal about metrology. It didn't seem very natural to me, but, well, somebody's thinking about way, ways to do boson sampling to make it useful. So I, I don't know much about it, actually. Um, there are lots of problems, I mean, difficulties in scaling up experiments like that. 
the main current bo bottleneck, I think, is the indistingu indistinguishable sources, fo photons. It's very hard to make three, four, five photons which are indistinguishable. Uh, the interferometers, on the other hand, can be done with very high precision. We've seen even reprogrammable interferometers, but the source is still a problem. So people are working on condensed matter systems like quantum dots to make sources, single photon sources, which could be useful for this kind of task and for many other things in cryptography, for example. We have to account for losses, okay? How do losses affect the simulability? Maybe if you have too much loss, then it becomes simulable again. So there have been some studies in that direction, and that, that's something that you have to worry about. And the last thing, which is also in common with simulation and other tasks, uh, certification. Um, can you develop other certification tests which are scalable and which would work for this large boson sampling? Or th that's an important thing, right, if you are, we are to build uh, experiments like that. So the main motivation for this kind of experiment is to test quantum mechanics in a larger computational power of quantum mechanics on a larger scale. And, of course, to do these boson sampling machines is much easier than doing a general universal quantum computer that factors. So that's why there's this race to make a, either a quantum simulator or a boson sampling machine that you can prove is doing something that you can't do on a normal computer in any reasonable amount of time. So that's the main motivation. But as you've seen from 80% of my talks, right, there are other motivations for looking at boson sampling because it's a restricted model and you can either cut it and make it even more restricted, or you can make it universal by changing some things. And there are connections between all these models, IQP, boson sampling, measurement based computation, which are very interesting on their own. They tell us about different things that quantum mechanics can do for us computationally, and uh, different ways that you can go about reaching these regimes. Some of them may be easier to do in experiments, like boson sampling. And uh, that's another motivation for looking at it. Right? So. Um, Thank you a lot for your attention. It's been a pleasure to, to give this course. Actually, to think about all these things, organize my ideas was nice. And I'm enjoying the other talks also, uh, like a student, right? So not just you are learning, I am learning too. So thank you for your attention. Do we have questions? Um, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there is any way in which these protocols can be implemented, but with entangled but non-pure states. Is it very? Is so hard? Or how is it? With entangled mixed states. Well, DQC1, right? I mentioned DQC1, uh, and there's a proof of hardness which uses a slightly different way, a slightly different proof of this polynomial hierarchy collapse. But it, it is a polynomial hierarchy collapse proof of hardness of simulating DQC1. But it's a bit different from the other models because DQC1 only allows for one measurement. So you can't really talk about post-selection because you need many things to be measured so that you can post-select on some of them, getting some result. But so what I, what I mean is there could be co other connections between DQC1 and IQP and unadaptive measurement based on computation that I'm, I'm not aware of. But uh, nobody is, I think. You see? So, and DQC1 uses mixed states. That's what I'm talking about, DQC1. So it would be interesting to connect DQC1 to the other models and see whether you could do some of these other protocols using mixed states as well to advantage. So that's the first way, I think, that you could think about mixed states in this kind of restricted models. Thank you. How do, does detection efficiency uh, affect scalability of the problem? Because if you have like N uh, detection efficiency eta, you very quickly get nothing, you know? It's true, it's true. Um, you could do, I mean, this could be a problem both at the beginning and at the end of the computation. At the beginning, because if you're using these parametric down conversion sources, you need the heralding to work. So if, you, if for example, the photon goes in the, the, the chip, but you haven't heralded it, that's a problem. You see? But this, in principle, can be solved because you can use the heralding to open and close shutters so that you actually are sure that the thing went in or not, that the, the thing went in only when heralding, see? So you can solve that part. The other part, which is uh, detection efficiency at the end, is more complicated if you don't know exactly how many photons you have in the, in the chip and you may be losing some due to detection efficiency. 
Um, but I don't know much about that. Maybe, no. yeah, I don't know. It's complicated and it, it, it is a problem. It is a problem. If you, if you, if you look at, this is one of the main things that uh, limit the size of experiments. One is detection efficiency and the other is losses because if you include losses in coupling to the chip, coupling out of the chip and detection, it may be 80%, you know. Uh, you're only looking at maybe 20%. So, I'm sorry? The only solution would be to integrate everything yes, inside the chip. Yes, yes. So that 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 particular implementation with the the programmable linear optics uh, chip is very impressive because it can control completely the unitary. But there's losses there, and the losses are are I'm, I would bet that they are asymmetrical, like we had in our chip triangular. So you have to ca characterize those losses first in order to make everything work. That's bad. And also, of course, losses decrease the, the count rate that you have. So in that case as well, it would be needed to include the sources in the chip and the detections. That will be the next step, I guess. Um, but it's not done yet, even in that chip. Do we have more questions? Today we have a surprise for those who ask questions. We have t-shirts. Yeah. Oh. Marmelada. <laughs> So I think it's just fair that I ask you, as well as I did for Richard, whether you believe that quantum computation can be efficiently <laughs> simulated by a classical computer. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't bet on it, right? So I, I suppose we would be on, on opposing ends of the bet, but, uh, but nothing rules it out, so, so yeah. That's not the main motivation for me for looking at these models. So that's not what, what motivates me. It's not because I, I think they might. But it's true that, I mean, much more is simulable than we thought just a few years ago. So this is very easily uh, disregarded. And I think uh, people should uh, care about it more because they tend to hype things up. And many times you come up with some models, you see, this is the quantum such and such, and then you find out later that the classical such and such does the same thing, you know? It's very common, actually. So more, more care has to be uh, done in looking at the, 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 cap the capabilities of classical systems. Many times people don't do that because they want to hype the results, so it's quantum something. But uh, I agree that you have to study more what, what this classical side of things. Any question? Well, it's not really a question, but just a compliment. Can you comment about how this has helped to uh, people that want to cal calculate quantum systems that now they can, which they couldn't before, because now they found it simulable? Sure, sure. So there's been lots of uh, ideas from, not from Boson sampling, right? But from, uh, from MPS state, well, we've seen this in this course, uh, coming from quantum information into condensed matter systems. So Guy Vidal is a guy who started in quantum information. Now he's very well known in condensed matter systems because he, he came up with this method for simulating ground states of compl complex Hamiltonians uh, using ideas from uh, matrix product states. And uh, this has become a very important, uh, important thing, even in, in condensed matter conferences. Sometimes you have a whole session just dedicated to this kind of simulation algorithm uh, that came up, fr that came from quantum information. So, especially in condensed matter, I would say there's lots of uh, results flowing in, in that direction. But condensed matter also gives back to quantum information, of course, uh, because of the implementations which they, you study, and also because some techniques that came from quantum information condensed matter, uh, they allow you to look for better resource states for cluster state quantum computation, for example, using these condensed matter techniques. So there's lots of uh, contact. There's even contact between mathematics and quantum mechanics. So for example, the, the, the proof that uh, the permanent of a unitary matrix is in the, is a modulus one, you know, is a complex number with, a, uh, with modulus one, is comp very complicated, the original proof. But there's another proof which is uh, learn quantum mechanics, learn about linear optics, and it's obvious, you know, because the sum of the probabilities add up to one. Uh, so it's, uh, there are lots of connections, and they're, they're quite interesting and, and useful. Any question? 
So the students who ask the questions and look for us afterwards for the t-shirts. And if we have no more questions, let's thank our speaker again.